Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Chris and I would uh, like to thank you uh, for coming today and uh, welcome you to our special symposium sponsored by the College of Agricultural and Life Sciences on big data and eco-informatics in agricultural research. Um, this, um, this symposium is, uh, oh, whoops. Yeah, I'm gonna fast forward past this part. The symposium is uh, really a, a culmination of a broad conversation that started within the college a little over uh, two years ago as part of a strategic planning process that involved faculty, staff, um, and administrators within the college. And one of the ideas that emerged from this workshop, from a workshop that was part of this process, uh, was the desire to come up with uh, more and better ways of using agricultural data to help make um, decisions relevant to agriculture and for supporting healthy ecosystems. One of the, the priority themes was actually on healthy ecosystems. And as we spoke to uh, colleagues in our college and beyond working in this area, we found that our work, either knowingly or not, uh, intersected with another emerging area that was also trying to take advantage of large data sets uh, for understanding and predicting how agricultural and natural systems uh, work. Uh, this area that was starting uh, was starting to get a label of, uh, of big data and uh, eco-informatics, a derived uh, term from that. And one of the surprising things in preparing for this symposium over the last year that Chris and I uh, found is that many of us don't always think of ourselves as big data researchers. We just kind of do our own uh, thing, and yet we find that we intersect with this field a lot. Um, and uh, uh, in fact, if you actually search the literature, uh, maybe starting five or 10 years back, it's actually very hard to find the term big data in agricultural research anywhere. And yet, the literature is full of examples of people using these approaches uh, to, study, uh, to study their systems. So it's actually quite difficult to get, to get our arms around the entire field and what it looks like, because it has been such a diffuse field. And so this symposium is in part an attempt to uh, better understand the outlines of this emerging area and how perhaps the college is uh, best positioned to help advance it. Um, through our uh, thinking about this uh, topic, uh, we've uh, chosen speakers both from within our university as well as national and international experts to help us better define the opportunities, uh, the challenges, and the potential pitfalls for advancing um, this area in agricultural uh, research. So I, I, I want to apologize to all of our colleagues that we were not able to include uh, as part of the symposium. And, and we also fully admit that we really weren't able to capture all of the different dimensions that, uh, that are um, data-driven and relevant to uh, agriculture and our college. Uh, conspicuously absent are going to be aspects of agriculture relating to animal health uh, and breeding. Uh, social dimensions of agriculture, uh, business and marketing dimensions, and so on. Uh, nevertheless, I think you'll find that a lot of the concepts and ideas and approaches uh, that our speakers are going to talk about uh, really can help inform uh, this field and all these other areas more broadly. Uh, so with that, I'd actually like to invite our uh, Associate Dean for Research, Bill Barker, uh, from the College of uh, Agriculture and Life Sciences to uh, make a few words for us. Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, on behalf of the College of Agricultural and Life Sciences. Thank you for pressing on me. Oh, my God. <laughs> well, that was a sterling beginning, wasn't it? Go ahead. Keep... What did that do? Nothing. Keep Just... doing what you're doing. <laughs> OK, so now you know. Get and... it all up. That was my whole. <laughs> <laughs> We're well ahead of schedule now. <laughs> <clears throat> On behalf of the College of Agricultural and Life Sciences and Dean uh, Kate Vandenbosch, I'd like to welcome you to today's symposium, and I'm really impressed that such a good number of you came out on uh, a cold, rainy Wisconsin spring morning. Uh, Kate Vandenbosch is uh, currently returning from Baltimore from a big conference, and she hopes to join us around lunchtime, and she'll have some more erudite remarks than I'll be able to deliver, I'm sure. Um, I'd also like to welcome Dr. Uh, Parag Chitnis. He's the Deputy Director of the USDA NIFA Institute of Food and 
production and sustainability and he'll be talking this afternoon and I'd also like to remind you that in the morning at 10:15 he'll be pleased to host a uh, an hour long informal question and answer about NIFA if any of you are interested in that and that's in room 175 in the in the fanciest biochemistry building I don't know what the formal name of it is but as you can see from the incredibly diverse array of topics and speaker affiliations, this is an inherently dis inter interdisciplinary field of research, and that really plays to one of UW's great strengths, our, our, our low or non-existent barrier to collaborations in our interdisciplinary culture. Uh, now, so those are my formal remarks and you don't have to scratch a geologist very hard to get to the historian beneath and so I'd like to give you a little history. Uh, when I was a kid uh, I was really fond of the comics and I was also a science geek and growing up under the shadow of Sputnik and I was really fascinated with technology and I remember being just really fascinated by Dick Tracy's uh, radio wristwatch. And I thought, boy, if I could ever get my hands on a two-way radio or... And then it turned, of course, into a two-way television. And I thought, whoa, that's really cool. Um, well, you know, here we are 50 years later, and I never got my, um, my wristwatch. But I got this instead, right? So I'm going to use this technology now to answer one of the most basic agricultural questions using big data. Now we practice this Siri and I, so it better work. <laughs> Good morning, Siri. Good morning. Is it raining today? Yes, I think we'll see some rain for today. Can y'all hear that? <laughs> and what is the temperature? I can only answer one weather fact at a time. Be home. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> That didn't happen before. <laughs> what is the humidity? I can't get the humidity index for the entire day, but currently it's 90%. And how hot will it get today? No, definitely not. The high should only be about 46 degrees. Okay. <laughs> you know, I wanted to do that, but what it does is it says, okay, here's the futures indexes, and it's, so I didn't have any way to show it on the screen, but you can get all that information at the touch of a button, and Siri will help you. Now, those are very basic questions that every farmer wants to know, right? But if you think about it, that little simple technology, which now, of course, to everyone in this room is mundane, you know, we take it completely for granted. I can open up another app and get a five minute old high definition movie of next rad radar and I can tell you whether I can make it home in five minutes without getting wet. That's where we are. Now Wisconsin has a very very long history in this area. Right? The patron saint of Wisconsin science Increase Lapham founded the National Weather Service in 1870 so that he could put out storm warnings for the ships on the Great Lakes. Convinced President Grant to uh, open it up for him. And I mentioned Sputnik, it went up in what, 57? By 1959, scientists on campus were working with uh, the federal government to put weather experiments on satellites. And in 1966, um, what's his name? Werner Sumi? From, uh, he founded the Space Science and Engineering Center. He worked with a, uh, an engineering professor named Robert Parent. And they, in 1966, on an ATS-1 rocket, put a, it was a geostationary satellite, they put up a, what was called a spin-scan camera. And they took the, whole, the first whole disk picture of the Earth. And Sumi's insight was the, the satellite doesn't move, but the weather does. So by taking a whole bunch of these pictures and then turning them into a little movie, that was the first time anybody had ever seen a global look at the Earth and its weather. So two weeks later, he was showing a movie of this thing to a big meteorological convention and got a standing ovation. So that's 100 years after uh, Lapham, right, increased Lapham. Of course, now today, 
on top of the AOS, the Atmospheric and Oceanic Sciences Building, there are an array of satellites that talk to all of the GOES, the geo, uh, geostationary weather satellites. And every day, all the data pours into the top of that building, is processed, and then pumped back out to make that weather forecast that Siri just told me about. Also, of course, they archive all those data. And uh, Steve Ackerman, a professor in, uh, in AOS, told me that they're archiving over, over uh, 1.5 terabytes of data a week. They've got a huge server room. It's just unbelievable what's going on over there. But that just goes to show you that the College of, the University of Wisconsin and CALS have been involved in big data for a long, long time. Um, and two things really strike me as, as interesting about this field. Number one, the, as I said, the inherent interdisciplinarity of it. And also the fact that it operates at all scales. We just talked about the global scale, but we'll hear from people today that are working on plant breeding, and so it actually works at the molecular scale too. And this idea that cheaper data collection and faster data collection is, is bringing in huge amounts of information. And we're, we're really actually quite overwhelmed with data at this point. That's what we're going to talk about today, I think, is, is so, you know, kind of welcome to the future, right? I went to a talk in, uh, in uh, Animal Sciences last week given by uh, Professor Noel Cockett, who's the president of Utah State University, and she's a sheep geneticist, and she went through her talk and one of the things she talked about in sheep genomics was when she started her career, it cost $5 a base pair to get genetic information. It took a long, long time. And now, of course, it's down to less than a penny a base pair. And she also is complete. She told me at the, at the reception afterwards that they were just completely deluged with data, too. So that, I think, is, is the interesting part about this that, that we don't have quite a good handle on yet. Well, anyway, um, today I'm, I'm really pleased to see you all here, and I, and I think that um, we can look forward to a long day of, of very interesting talks and conversations with one another. And who knows what will come out of this. I hope that in, you know, 50 years from now, my successor is standing in a symposium like this talking about how spectral imaging of leaves and robotics and big data came together to have real-time crop information for farmers and it was born on this campus so again thank you very much and i'll look forward to talking to y'all all day long